curious, how many people actually saw this in the theater back in 1982? Wow, right? I didn't. This is really just for me, so I can see it on the big screen on the other side. Uh, so we are fortunate enough to have some members of the cast and crew here tonight. And I think I'm going to start bringing them up.
I don't know that much about lenses and all that, so I say, here's what I would like it to look like, and then magically there are guys around to make it happen, sometimes it does. And anyhow, um, other than that, I think the, the talent show is a favorite, but I, what, what I liked about it this time, aside from the musical numbers, was I found a bit of a kind of warmth and emotional appeal about high school honesty and, and high school anxiety and the relationships underneath it all. And um, that, that I liked. <laughs> well, um, one of the things I noticed watching it now as an adult, or as opposed to an adult as I could be, uh, was it's a, a very female empowering in this, this movie. It's not like the whole time, right? With, with, with all the big ladies having their own kind of uh, perspective here and just not letting the T-Birds walk all over them, which was really fun. Except for Goose. Uh, okay, so I'm going to ask Goose, he's right next to Pat. Chris McDonald. What? Talk to me about the process, getting, getting involved with Grease 2. This is a very interesting thing. First, I want to say thank you all for coming, you Greasers, you. Uh, <laughs> it's, it was wonderful to see it on the big screen. It's been forever. And of course, my kids watch it every Sunday. <laughs> well, I had a really strange experience. I really wanted this guy's part right here. So I came in five times for Johnny Navarro. <laughs> you can't wash the Irish off of my face, so Pat, smart, said, no. And I went home and I cried. I said, <laughs> Call comes that night, would you come in tomorrow, we're mixing and mashing. You probably don't remember this, but oh God, do I. <laughs> and um, it was an extraordinary thing. I came in, I had nothing to lose. And it's all about all the, any, any actors in the room? Anyone? <laughs> now I say, show up. I could have been like that guy, but I'm not going with that, you want me? But I went back in, they mixed and mashed, and, um, and, and this was a, a life changer, and I thank you again for it. Oh. I've made lifelong friends with this movie. We ran into each other at a, at a, at a celebration of a great directors at the, at the you know, the uh, mm -hmm. Rod Sterling Awards, and he made this thing happen, and Brian made this happen. Miracles came tonight. Maxwell Paul was on the stage in New York City right now. He came all the way up to New York and a day off. Hopefully it's not the show. He's doing the show. So anyway, it's, a, it's kind of a, a miracle. And I'm so glad this came off as well as it did. And it doesn't happen without you. So God bless you all. Thank you. And, and Chris being humble, he, he was actually the first person I talked to about uh, this event uh, and how we get in touch with a lot of people and he's been really great about, about keeping, uh, keeping it alive. All right. So, Allison, what was it? Yeah. What was it like working for your mom? <laughs> Maybe we better pass it on.
rough time about getting the part. Oh, yeah. Everybody else was sure they wanted her, and I wasn't sure. <laughs> that was quite right. Because she's such a little lean girl, but they wanted was a, a very funny, you know, not quite so pretty comedian. And I thought, well, yeah, I guess she can do it. <laughs> but, um, I gotta tell you, we worked hard. It wasn't all fun games by any means. There was a lot of very hard work and work on, com on comic timing. The, the takes of these guys all did. Amazing, just amazing. And the, the, just the improv. And the, it was hard work and they really came through. Great. I actually wanted to let everybody know here too, uh, the, the general consensus, and you started to speak to it, is how warm of the environment, the more, how warm the environment was on the, on the shoot. How everybody got along and how much fun they had. So we, we were trying, and Chris was helping, trying to get Tad Hunter here tonight, Aww. Mr. Stewart. And he's doing fine. Don't, don't, you know, come on. He's okay. He's alive and well. <laughs> Uh, but I want to read a little note from him for you guys. It says, sorry I can't be with you all this evening. Really appreciate your asking me to join you for what sounds like a fun screening. Please give everyone my best. Shooting Grease 2 was a great experience. I send love to all. So, there you go. That's the and uh, I'd like to shoot him in right now because I don't know if anybody knows Lauren Love, who played Paul Ledge, going through yeah. some yeah. stuff right now. So we're wishing her all the best. We're dedicating the whole evening to Lauren.
was the, the writer, Ken Finkelman, did, did that in, in high school all the time. And he, he said that this bit has to be in this movie. So he told me this on day one of shooting, and he said, you better start practicing. I thank God we didn't shoot that scene until about two, two months later or something like that, but I practice absolutely every single day. Uh, uh, and all. But actually, you know, you're all here, you're all probably in the business of anything. When I turned over, I, I did swallow it, but when the camera came on my back, I didn't have a cigarette in my mouth anymore. I just had smoke. Uh, uh, so. Let me, let me just say something about Pat Birch uh, and, and the whole Grease family and everything. Pat, it, she, Pat was the original choreographer of the, the show on Broadway uh, along with Tom Correct. It's, it's a magic that the two of them always had with that show, and that is casting the right people in, in the role. And she brought a lot of that magic to our version of Grease 2. She got the right people in the right place at the right time. And uh, that's, that's one of the things that is, is magical. And the other thing that Grease 2 kind of captures is, is that what we had on Broadway was that sense of innocence that we all had, that we were trying to be cool, we weren't really cool. <laughs> and it, there was a vulnerability about everything that we were all doing and, and had brought that element to, to, to our, our production. And I just have to say, after all these years, this woman, I would not have done Johnny Nagarelli had it not been for her. They, Alan Carr and Robert Stigwood wanted a rock star in my role. And she kept on bringing that. They got one, that. they got one. <laughs> she kept on bringing that right after a rock star would audition and Robert and Alan said, all right, it still is, it still is. And because of her, I, I, I ended up doing that. And she has, was awesome. She gave me free reign. And boy, but boy, did she give me free reign on, on this whole thing. But it was, it was really one of the most amazing. When you say we had a family, uh, it, it truly was. We were like in high school. We were in high school. And we had the best time of our lives. It really was. To this day, I've never had more fun doing a project than doing Grease 2. It shows on screen. It shows on screen. It's awesome. It's great. No homework, no detention. <laughs> All right, Maxwell. So, uh, how much of the motorcycle riding did you do? <laughs> you would lead off with that. I would. Uh, I did all my kissing. It was very painful. Pulling it up with Michelle Pfeiffer all over again, watching that screening just now. She was absolutely uh, yes. incandescent, wasn't she? Uh, but it was, it was. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. I, that, that actually shocked me. We, 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 the film premiered at, on the west coast here at the Cinerama Dome, and that's now known as what's it called now? That's Art Light. Art Light. Art Light. Thank you. And then also an amazing cinema in uh, New York called the Ziegfeld, which is Woo! huge, fantastic, or, you know, prestige, flagship cinema. And uh, I remember being absolutely stunned uh, watching that sequence with the Gary Davis, the brilliant stunt guy, who, who obviously did the uh, Cool Rider stunts. And he, um, I had no idea uh, that they'd gone out to Griffith Park and shot this extra footage where Michelle Clearly, Michelle had wrapped herself around Gary, and then he'd done a wheelie. And I must say, I, I gnashed my teeth over that one. And, uh, it was, um, uh, and, and there was fun things like that. It was an amazing group called Stunts Unlimited, who who were the guys who played all uh, um, Bal, the bad guys, Balducci's, uh, yeah, Balmudo's, Balmudo's. I'm supposed to be in New York. Armando, <laughs> Armando, and his henchmen. But uh, for example, it's, it's this reference to everyone being family. I mean, we you Pat was again the genius of the casting of pulling so many fresh faces and, and giving so many of us such a great break. You know, uh, a lot of us were wholly unqualified. I was too. They wanted you say you say they wanted a rock star. They wanted a genuine teen idol. Uh, and so uh, we both, both, both were very fortunate and beat out some really serious competition. Um, but uh, back to uh, the, uh, the idea of Balmudo, 
Uh, no, I've lost my train of thought. You know, Brian Hughes. Uh, the stunts, thank you. The, um, in the scene, for example, when uh, I pick her up in the garage and she's being uh, surrounded by other uh, drivers, you know, wanting service, uh, th that was the head of the Stunts Unlimited group, him and his wife, who was screaming the street. <laughs> when I went into the uh, junkyard to, you know, to, 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 to assemble the bike, that was the camera operator. And, you know, and by the way, those two, that, that lighting cameraman department, uh, team rather, they were old school. They'd been trained uh, in, the, in from the heyday of Hollywood. They'd apprenticed in the, in the 40s. And so they knew fantastic techniques to light people. The guy who did my hair had done Elvis Presley's hair all through his killer movies in the 60s. I mean, it was top, top draw talent. Lewis and Lewis put that amazing score together. How many of the numbers just kept coming in this film? It was incredible. It really was a full-blown musical, and it was such a hoot. We, we were having the time of our lives, and obviously it was, it was a fantasy for a, an English guy to come over here and suddenly go to a rock and roll high school <laughs> with, with the coolest cast, and they're still my very best friends. So, I mean, I'm curious, how long has it been since you've all seen each other? We run into each other a lot, and uh, you do three years ago. Yeah, uh, you, 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 you. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, I about three years ago. Lisa, all, almost everybody there yeah. said yeah. Muffy wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> we did. A, oh, excuse me, already. We, we called her Muffy. Oh no! <laughs> why? Wait, why? This is great. Allison. Oh, right. Allison. I was going to name Muffy. Allison, talk to us.
Dang it. Dude, where is his wrist bone? It's not even there. And so Maxwell said, oh, you know what? I bet you kind of look like Stalker Channing, so maybe... Maybe... Davey Jaworski is somehow related to Rizzo from the first movie. So we have so much faith. So he's like, we should actually see if we can get that together. So we go over to where he dragged over to wardrobe and hair and makeup and they put me in the wig. They have Rizzo's jacket from the first movie, so they put that on. And I have on a old pointy brazier and a skirt and the heels and everything. And so they're like, go into where they're showing the daily. No fear, and so they push me onto the stage from the side door, you know, not from the side, and I'm right at stage level, and I come out, and the screen is projecting the movie, and I have the sunglasses, just like the first one, and I lower them, and I say, this movie is shit, the first one was much better. And they laughed, and they let us sit and watch the dailies that day, so we were very happy about that. I have to, I have to say that... When you call and we've been talking about the event, we've bombarded in a wonderful way, bombarded me with about 30 photos from his time on the set of Grease 2. And half of the lobby and half of the reception prior are covered with his photos. First photo he sent to me was him dressed as Rizzo. And it was wonderful. Pretty good. You look great as Rizzo. It was fantastic. All right, I'm going to open up. Uh, the theater here for questions, but I have one question that I asked Maxwell since I saw the movie in, in 82 on cable. Uh, what did you whisper to to <laughs> Mitchell? What really fun to know that? Oh, you something mean about me. No, actually I told her a nursery rhyme. And it was, uh, if I remember right, it was uh, Old MacDonald sitting on a fence beating his meat with a monkey. <laughs> Missed his meat and hit his balls. Now he pisses in his overalls. <laughs> and then in the editing room, he was to say, he just got that little bit, and little, little, little Pamela goes, that's the brakes. That's her right That's true. It's really true. I recall it very distinctly. <laughs> I'm amazed that the kids uh, host, but I just come back I mean, right away. She was the dirtiest foul mouth. Oh yeah, because Pam couldn't do the hours that we did because we would record after we shot. So all day down in Norwalk that we did in buses and they'd take us up to Burbank somewhere to record the soundtrack. And Pam couldn't do those kinds of hours because she was a minor. So in the movie when she has a line... You bowled me over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. So who's got a question? We only have a few more minutes. So uh, your hand went up. Yeah. Um, well, first, Maxwell, I've been in love with you since 1982. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian, now, now, in the bowling number, that high note, I wrote, is that you? Oh yeah. That's yeah. Wow. Tell you how he achieves it, but he gets it. Oh, so tight short size, but I, mean, you know, I have to do that. I have to do that knee slide about 50 times because I had to hit a mark, and I kept on going one inch over it, a little bit before it, and stuff like that. That is a painful day. That's a pain. and, you know, bowling alleys were not meant to, meant to be danced upon. We had more injuries. Uh, in doing that shoot uh, to all the dancers that I, I've ever seen in my entire life doing Broadway or anything else, but uh, it was quite a quite a quite a great number. Uh, it really was. Oh God! All the from broken ankles and the twisted ankles and stuff like that. Well, we hid it from you, okay? <laughs> Right. <laughs> she was wearing sunglasses because she had a black eye. Oh, she had a black eye. Yeah. Wow. Cool. <laughs> but then, halfway through the number, because that's how long it took us to shoot it, about two or three weeks. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like two or three weeks. <laughs> 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 I never 
gave us that kind of time. Exactly. We would have loved it, but we never. I think that was maybe four days. Well, how about we shot score tonight? And not score tonight, uh, Prowlin. Prowlin, we shot literally in a 24 hour period. You're absolutely right. We were, we were not luxurious with time at all. And we were doing my biker's heaven, which I, I thought it was really so absolutely lovely. It's almost lovely. I think there are things like this up there. But it's right there, and Max, we look gorgeous at it. It's very lovely. But uh, that was because they didn't really want it. It was like three days. Three days to get the whole thing. With the fog, with the everything. Well, one of the stories about Brown was that we recorded it, and we were running so late in production, they weren't quite sure that we were going to really shoot it other than use the end of it at the uh, talent show. And when they heard it, they said, we got to shoot this. So Pat literally that day figured out a way how to shoot an entire number in 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> we were originally going to be in a grocery store. Yeah, we were originally supposed to go to a grocery store. Yeah, grocery store. Yeah. And they we said, no, we can't create a period grocery store interiors and all that. And that's when we came up with and let me just say thank you again, Brian, for, for acknowledging Pat. Not only has she paved the way for women directors, but on Broadway, too. Yes, she did. You are your own way there. I think the one thing about this, I think, yes, it's wonderful that women are, that we're all being empowered. But there's another thing, and I think I, I sort of said it before, whether you be whatever gender you decide or are, you got to know what you're doing. you got to be good at what you do. Maybe there are problems in the office. I did not have one problem with any guy on the set at all. Never, never was put down for being a woman. Was asked to wear the tighter jeans now and then, and that was fine. <laughs> And I kind of enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think they're all actually results they look good, right? And, and you, you begin to lose that. You're working very hard making everybody else look good. And it was important to me to stay looking kind of cute. And the guys liked that too. But the first day that we had that great big meeting, I'd never been to one of those, where you're the director and there are a hundred people there. Every, every department's in there. And I walked in there and I thought, oh my Lord. They, nobody doubted me because I was clear about what I knew and as I said before, what I didn't know. And I think as far as women directors go, we mustn't make too much of it. We just have to be good. Right. <laughs> I don't think we should spend too much time screaming me too, me too, me too. Better get our craft so good and then we can say, yes, you need me. But more time on that, and less time on uh, be nice to me or uh, empower me. I mean, we need that too. But we need to be very good at what we do before we scream and yell. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I told him we um, How involved was Alan Carr? What was it like working with him? <laughs> How involved was Alan Carr? Alan Carr? Quite involved. I mean, he was there every day. <laughs> uh, he was wonderful. Uh, we loved Alan and, uh, and Robert, all Robert also. It was just, they were wonderful to us. They gave us everything that, that we possibly asked for all the time. Support. Support. Enormous support. Enormous support. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, yes. Phillips, too. Yeah. Bill Oates is not going to say, is the executive producer on the film? He couldn't be here tonight, but he also echoed how ridiculously enjoyable the experience was. So that was pretty cool too, yes. I don't know if you know the impact you might have had on so many lives here that you made our, maybe, well, at least for me, speak to me, and maybe others, that our, my middle school, high school, elementary school experience was, maybe it wasn't awesome, but like having this movie made it awesome because you could, have any kind of situation in your life, but you could watch Grease too and listen to the songs over and over. And it was so good that almost really nothing else mattered because this movie was so amazing. <laughs>
of the original Grease and a package Grease suit with the original Grease. I think it's, I think it's April 24th. I'm, I'm a little bit of a Blu-ray.com geek, so I think it's April 24th. Yeah. Uh, yeah, get it out. Go get it. It's going to be great. Pre-order! Okay. Uh, Steve, Brad, what do you got? Yeah, the question's for Maxwell. Um, a few years after the movie was made, you ran into somebody at a party and it was a young actor, a young female actor, who's now doing a one-woman play across the United States, and she introduced herself to you, saying something like, I'm Pam, an actor also, and you walked away insulted, thinking that she said, um, I'm a ham actor also. The truth hurts. She's here tonight, and I was wondering if you guys could make up. <laughs> Scott refused, and then John and Olivia didn't really want to do it. 
And I suggested that they do just a little cameo. And my idea was a good one. Yes, when they took off on the motorcycle, you would have run out of gas, you would have stopped at a gas station, and that would have been John and Olivia's gas station. And, but then they couldn't make up political things and no deal was made. And I knew the minute Eddie Reason got out of the bus on, on Greece 2, and the only other person we really had was, was Dee Dee Khan, I think, yeah? yeah. That they really wanted to see some of the characters. They wanted you guys, they wanted to see you again. And uh, you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more. But that was the idea. Okay, great. Big yeah. wait, before we, we go uh, disperse and everything, I just want to say <laughs> one thing. Disperse. disperse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, as Brian uh, said, that Lauren's not doing well. She's a dear, dear love of ours. And uh, I talked to her husband, Colin. She sends her love, wish she could be here. She's in good hands. She's flying back from England uh, this week, and hopefully everything will be good for her. Please send her your prayers. Uh, yes. Uh, it seems like there was a, con a, a you know, you had a big, you had a big shoe to fill with, you know, making a sequel to this. You know, at that point, it's still a classic. It had been a classic, um, and I didn't know that an SNL writer or someone that was recommended by Lauren Michaels wrote it. Was there? It, it also seems. I, this is the first time I've seen it in many years, but it seems like it was much. There was a lot more comedy. It was funnier than the original. Was there a conscious effort to make it funnier? Or were you just funnier? No. <laughs> No, I think part of it was the casting for several three written for these guys. I mean, the, the story's not all that different, really. I mean, but these guys, I think, in some ways, there's a little bit more warmth there. And I'm not sure why. Because the regular degrees of time, time, from the time I came from the Kings of Mines in the bad part of Chicago, it was much tougher. I think we retained a little more toughness this time than we had in, in Greece. In Greece what? Listen, we can't top Greece, Randall, and Randall did an enormous thing. Tom and Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey doing the original show. I mean, it was pretty amazing. The history we don't have time to go into. It was a much tougher, gritty, they were horrendous people. <laughs> in, the one, in, the, in the show in Chicago. Came to New York, it got cleaned up a bit. They were so thrilled with that, but we did that. And then the only thing I didn't like about doing the first breeze, I loved doing it, but every time I saw the palm trees, I thought, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they, how, how do greasers live in the palm trees? <laughs> uh, it's very hard. They do, God knows they do. But um, no. We weren't trying to make it funny, we simply were telling a story. Yeah. These guys made it funny. Yeah. Well, on behalf of everybody, I just want to say thank you. Uh, not only for being here tonight, but honestly, the whole point of tonight was to celebrate the fun and the legacy of Greece 2. And, and watching on the big screen, I know there's so many more jokes, of the in-jokes, and, and it was just such a blast to hear everybody here quote lines, sing songs that you guys did, and, and that's amazing. I also, I want to, I got to thank um, uh, John Wood, So this group, uh, and myself, they, they just put this thing together beautifully for everybody. And I also want to thank the, the, the fans that also donated to help put this on as well. Uh, and that's it. Go get the Blu-ray, watch 3, 2, 1, 1, one High Def, and, and thank you very much.